the the goal for us today is to get to know Miss Laura Wheeling Wheeler Warren. She lived. She was born in 1887. Uh, lived to 1948, so she's not considered an old master necessarily, but she is a wonderful painter. And I, when I was asked the question of, of African American artists in the old master category, and I started looking, there were not very many that popped right up. So that got me thinking, you know, what the heck? And even right now, as far as who I'm following, um, I'm not seeing as many black painters, and I, I'm concerned about that. It's like, what is, what are the, the boundaries there, and what's going on with that? But I loved her story, and I listened to three or four videos. One of them was a professor at uh, Pennsylvania uh, Art Fine Arts uh, School, and she was very, she was hard to listen to. So I did a lot of scanning, and I, I wasn't going to even play clips from a, a little bit about the model first, because she's the one that we're going to be drawing today and looking at. Her name is Anna Washington Derry, and she was known, she went to church, I think, in the same community as Laura did, and I'm just going to say Laura instead of saying her whole name. So that's likely church, choir, school um, was likely where they met. She was the same generation as Laura's parents, born in about 1858. She was one of five kids. Um, her, her dad, likely, she, they lived in an area where uh, there were free blacks in the 1800s, some having arrived via the Underground Railroad. And we watched a little bit about Harriet Tubman last week with that artist, so I thought that was a nice connection there. And they had immigrated to this area for better conditions. Um, her dad worked as a day laborer, and her brothers served in the 8th Regiment of the U.S. Colored Troops during the Civil War. By the 1880s, uh, she was on her own, and she was working as a domestic servant. She, she married a man, Benjamin Derry, who was much older than her, several years older. With He already had two boys, a boy and a girl, and they lived um, in this area near where L Laura lived. So, the years before Laura did this painting of her, she worked as a laundress while her husband worked as a day laborer. And so, their children both were employed at the school where Laura taught. So, we're going to see more about that. That was called the Cheney Training School for Teachers. So, I love this last paragraph about her. This woman of humble origins was far from the artist's usual subject matter. Wheeler typically painted family members and friends, which is a lot of what we find ourselves doing, and she actively sought opportunities to paint high-profile, socially prominent, and esteemed citizens, black and white, although she would execute a series of portraits of accomplished African Americans in the 40s that has been widely documented and exhibited. This one that we're studying is cited as her most successful portrait. So it's interesting that we chose that or that I chose that um, as I looked at all of her work that one really has emotion and just jumped out at me so I wanted to just give you a little bit of information about her she did win an award for this in 1927 and um, there's a little comparison between a couple of, of Laura's paintings this one talked about the portrait of Anna is done in browns, grays, and beiges. It's not a real colorful painting, but as you compare it to this other one of this lady, Evangeline Rachel Hall, was I, I believe another teacher in the school where Laura taught. Um, th there's a big contrast between the two of those. Um, the lady's wearing a corsage, um, sort of like an exclusive sorority type thing. She's this lady is also African-American, but it says clearly a member of the black middle class, the kind of person who inhabited Wheeler's personal and professional sphere. So there's a contrast here. Yes, Denise, jump in there. <clears throat> this week sometime, I, I don't know if I heard this from you. I can't remember where I heard it from, but I was either watching something or someone told me that back in the day, the African-American artist could not be uh they some of them would um 
they would not be visible at showings or anything. They couldn't. Was it you that told me that? Um, they could not. They would go in, this one artist that I heard about would go into the museum to see her own work and to listen to what people were saying because she couldn't be there for the opening. Yes. Because she was African American. More atrocities. Yes, but. more atrocities. And you and you see in some of her work, and we'll look at that a little bit later, but she they just said done by a Negro artist. They did not sign her name. To, they would not put her name in the publications or the articles about the illustrations, which is so so ludicrous and so sad that she had, you know, and, and I'm sure, just, and she had a really hard time getting paid um, as well. So we see some evidences of them not wanting to pay her and pay her very little for her illustrations. Um, I pulled this one up because this reminded me of our sketch notes. This was an um, illustration she did for this. This, is, this magazine, The Crisis, is the longest magazine ever in print. Uh, from 1921, I believe. I've got that written in my notes, but it is um, at the official magazine of the NAACP, and we're going to find out a little bit more about who started it, but I loved that she had her sketch notes here before she ever did that illustration. This was an Egyptian theme that was going on at the time, and, and a theme, so I love that. I love seeing the behind the scenes with people and how they plan out their work. I figured each week we would look at a little bit more about her, uh, just kind of quickly, but I wanted you to see, because we're going to be so intimate with this figure today, that I wanted you to know a little bit about the model. So this was the other thing that we'll see when we get ready to do the background next week. We will see a little bit more in that upper background. You'll see letters placed beside her head uh, where the artist painted her name out, which is unusual, and I love that. She wanted you to know this woman and not her for her to just be some lost in history person, which is, you know, uh, when I did the Waterhouse study, I was trying to find out about his models and there was not much information except some of his journal notes about his models. So when I went to New York, I tried to always find out my models' names and write those on the back of my painting because I felt like that was important to know who they were and to remember them because they... You got intimate with them after painting them for five days. You know, you knew them. Um, she said, this is actually the artist's variation on their subject's name. In most of the documents that were located, death certificates, it's Annie. It's Annie. Um, for Laura to add the more formalization of her subject's persona, um, she also adds Anno Domini, 1920, and you can't see that. What year? In the year of our Lord is what Anno Domini means. This cultural reference is perhaps a reflection in the artist's mind of the sitter's natural dignity. At the bottom right corner, the artist has signed the painting in bold print. Um, her name, L. Wheeler. And, I, and unfortunately, she couldn't sign it Laura because she had two strikes against her, a woman and a woman of color. And you know, my back in the early 1990s, not so far back, but Shirley used to tell us not to put our first name. She would tell us, just put your initial. And, and many writers the same, because if they see see you as a woman, they're not gonna look at it the same way. So ho hopefully that's not the case anymore, but could be. Those pictures. Well, I wanna say, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really happy that you're bringing that out and, and um, about the black artists that I'm sure there was a lot of them but we couldn't, they couldn't be shown or whatever because of history, you know, because of all that crazy stuff. But thank you for um, bringing that. And it just happened to be um, Black History Month this month too. So what a way to start it off. I love that. <laughs> so, so thank you for bringing that out, Christy. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a joy for me and I'm, I'm glad to- um... Can I say something? Yes, jump in there, Peach. Would you, is, do, are any of you aware of the guys? I can't remember what they called them. I'll have to find them. They were in Florida. They were, they were working men, all African-American, and oh my gosh, their artwork was incredible. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? No. Hey. Well, you got to find that for us, Pete. I'd like to know. Well, you fluff around. Yeah. <laughs> You fluff around, she said. Okay. Does he fluff around? <laughs> Just a little fluff. Yeah. Jump in there. 
The Highwaymen. The Highwaymen. Okay. Yeah. I will send you guys the link. You're just going to croak when you see their work. Unbelievable. They're from the early 50s. I, was, I wasn't even born yet. That's what this is about, you know. I'm, I'm kind of stuck, and, and sometimes I get in a rut to where I don't learn about new artists. And that was the most important part of my early training was going to museums and getting so excited. Oh, I found it. You know, I'll never forget when I found um, Sargent and Philip Laszlo, De Laszlo. I was like, oh my gosh, look at his work. Um, I wanted to just flip through. I'm going to be using, starting next week or, or the following week for the, for the final piece, I'm going to be using this um, Stillman Byrne sketchbook. So, and I wanted to show you, I wanted, I know you, some of you guys have seen this, but I wanted to flip through the pages so far of what some of us have studied together in this book from Mary Cassatt, um, Pot, Pot Haste, who was that, Renoir, Waterhouse, uh, forget that guy's name, the, the duck painter, Coyster, that's not his name either, Daniel <laughs> Gerhardt's, um, Lillian Genth, Sargent, and what, who's he, Raphael? Um, just how much I enjoy flipping through that sketchbook. It's become very dear to me. So if you wanna just play around today with an old sketchbook, if you wanna transfer those, I think it's nice to have both. When I looked at some of my pages and I had my study on one side and my painting on the other, it was really cool to look at the process between those two. So you may want to play today and, and another one next week when we start to add a little color. And we will add color with whatever you want to next week. It's not going to be a serious painting. It's going to be watercolor or markers or colored pencils or just something to play and even limit yourself to see how you can portray the colors that you see with something very um, small. What we're going to do first is we are going to do simple basic shapes like we did with sketch notes. We're going to do circles, triangles, boxes. That is going to be our exercise now. I'm going to share the so screen. Yeah. Is it leading is it leading up to that drawing? That's what we're doing cuz yes. cuz I want to put it in the same book that because I have my color my paintings in in one of those books too and I okay. wanted to so um, I would not use your pages in that book for this because this is plain. This is if you okay. want, if you want to put them, make three small paint drawings. You can whatever you want to do, but I really played and it's a mess. And I just want okay. us to do three separate drawings today. One is going to be basic shapes, stating it as simply as we can without a lot of detail and thinking okay. about the shape. The second one is going to be just drawing the outline of it the silhouette with no internal drawings. And the third one is gonna be massing it with simple shapes and values. So okay. there's gonna be three separate drawings and they're going to be um, very quick and not detailed. So I, you'll see I have to stop myself um, quite a bit. Oh, here we go, goodness gracious. Can you see? Okay, this is the beginning of the mm -hmm. February Old Master study of artist Laura Wheeler Waring. She is an African-American artist born in 1887 to 1948. So not really considered necessarily an old master, but just looking for someone to study in the African-American culture who has uh, been influential in the art world and could not find very many. So I was pleased to find her work and some very interesting information about her. So today we're gonna to be using um, just the basic sketching pieces of, sometimes it's called willow charcoal. I'm using that. You can also use, this is a charcoal holder. So if you're uncomfortable with those small pieces, you can use this. I also have just a regular mechanical pencil. I like to use these when I'm working in a sketchbook particularly. It'll be very light, will be a little difficult for you, you guys to see. So the next thing I'm gonna do is look at these images of her. There are several of these paintings of Anna Washington Derry. And I've taken a sketchbook application on my phone, a little sketch app called 
uh, I believe it's just a sketch and I'll show you a picture of that and I've put a couple of different filters on it just to look at the essentials the values just to see what pops out what are the darkest lines what are the abstract shapes that pop out so just looking at it the <clears throat> the main shapes I see are this uh, these V shapes of her hand the top of her hand her neckline uh, her head is at an angle if I hold up a measuring stick or, or a pencil her head is at this angle which typically uh, heads are her shoulders are almost straight almost straight we can't see much of this side of the shoulder but they're almost straight um, this is sort of a square her shoulders and bust area are a square her head of course is uh, an oval and if we learn with the basic shapes we learn that the the most basic essential shape is a, a sphere and a box on the bottom so we'll we'll put that on there and do that as our basic shape to start with and then we'll expand a little bit further it's a little bit easier to see on these uh, black and white images here's just a black and white image you kind of want to go to the details when you look at this but you see that her head in this upper area is the darkest part of the painting uh, there's darks, little darks that move the eye around the painting. This hand on the right side is darker than the hand on the left side. It's catching more light over here. The lightest lights on the painting are right behind her head, and sometimes that's a good um, way to bring attention to the face. And down here on the cuffs of her sleeves, those are the lightest lights. Darkest darks are her hair, of course. Next would be the shadows on her forehead. It's hard to tell the light source here um, with their skin tone like that. It seems to be that the light is coming from this direction because this is the, the lighter side of her face. But the shadow is, is cast back that way. So maybe it's coming this way. It's a little tricky. Um, the light's hitting the top of her fingers this way. So if that were the case, her shadow would have been that way. So it must be kind of front, front lit because you can see the tops of her hands here or her wrist is, is lit. There's some light catching on her, on her collar. And spending a little bit of time looking at all this beforehand really helps. So I did spend a little bit more time again looking at it. And I think that's um, a problem that I have often. I jump right in. And instead of just sitting there making some observations about what I see. So uh, that's part of what this, this preliminary part was. Where's the light coming from? What are the basic shapes? Um, and this next little four or five minutes is laying those basic shapes in. All right, so here we go with most basic shape. I like to put a little line as to where I'm starting. And I like to just quickly in just a minute decide how many heads tall she is she is almost a head tall to her arm so about right here is where the second head goes so one two and about two and a half heads tall so that gives me a, a pretty good idea is she smack dab in the middle no she and, and our brain always wants to put a person smack dab in the middle so I'm already starting to do the head this way and it's this way so let's do her skull this way and then the box of her chin this way. Back, once again, we're just, we're not doing any measuring, we're just doing basic shapes. No detail. So let me make that a little bit darker for you. Remember if you get your hand going in centrifugal motion, you're going to do a whole lot better for a ball and a box. Head, shoulders, I could go ahead and do the square on there, that might help a bit. Okay, okay so again, basic shape. Uh, let me go a little bit darker. Ball, 
box, corner of chin, that's the, the most basic. Okay, so I'm going to develop, I'm going to, I want to stop right there for just a second. Um, I found as I'm sitting here watching this that there's a certain rhythm that I have a habit of doing now. And I think that's imp when you get your hand going, sort of like a warm up, you'll more likely be rhythmic as you lay your strokes down. If you just try to go in there and draw your circle like this and then draw the lines as you see them. But there's a rhythm of like her arms, there's are like a swing down there. You see that scoop of how her arms are crossed? There's this scoop that you can only do when you get kind of get that rhythm going with your hands. So that this is where you should be right now. This is as far as you should be. If you have to do this two or three times, that's fine. But I believe if you can see her laying on the page in these most basic shapes, make sure you've laid it in the right place because the next two drawings I do, I put smack dab in the middle. And I don't even notice it until the end when I get down here to the hands and they're running off the page. So my mistakes, um, even after all this time, I still, my brain wants to stick the head right in the smack dab middle. Okay, so I'm going to develop this basic shape just a little bit further. I'm just going to make, the more we learn about this before we begin, the final piece, the better. So I'm noting that the collar is right here on the corner of her chin. Um, if, I, if I held a plumb line up, it would come right up through the center of her face like this. So that kind of tells me I'm close. This may need to go over a bit more. She's going to bring her collar over and her shoulders aren't as long as I think. So once I get into the measuring part, I'll be able to check all that. But just basic shapes, getting back to basic shapes again, I'm squinting my eyes. If this were a sphere and the light is coming from the front, uh, when we do the value study here in a minute, we'll, we'll pay a little bit more attention to that, but how we would shade this head. This um, neckline comes straight up almost through the center of where her, the middle of her head would be. So, again, you know, it's almost hard to just be so basic without this without measuring. But again, it's just starting to notice some things that are going on in this painting. That's why the charcoal is so nice, because it lets you just move freely and not worry too much about uh, having to erase. All right, so there's kind of my basic shape. Uh, the, the arms come up. It's not much. There's not much distance there. When we get to the real detailed drawing here, we're going to want to measure to see, but we already know that her head comes just above. That's the second head, and there's about where the where the um, the wrist starts, about right there. So that's about right. That's just eyeballing it. The more you do this, the more you the more depth you get at it. I'm also going to see some simple shapes, like in her cheek here, and I'll go ahead and put those in. Even though I haven't measured anything yet, I'll put them in, but I think I'm probably off on this, this size of the head. Let me just quickly see where the halfway mark is on, her, on this whole head in this view. The halfway mark is most likely her eye. The eye on the right is the halfway mark. So we're going to say, yep. So once I've put that into place, I know that this cheekbone is going to go right under that. So there's a circle. I could go ahead and put another circle for the other cheekbone. And I also, another big simple shape that I see just direct, directly over is the, the ball of her nose. And then I see a big circle for her mouth and chin. So a little bit of a jowl or a small cheek line over on the other side. And then the eyes, of course, are big circles. I know it looks creepy like this. 
looks like a skeleton. But if you're building the skeleton before you start on the whole head, you're going to do a whole lot better. You're going to have a good base to, to draw on. See, I can't help myself. I want to go ahead and start drawing. The bottom of her ear comes down here along the, her mouth. And so there's also a big simple shape for her ear, a big oval shape. You can go ahead and put that on. Some more uh, simple shapes here for her hair. Do you, do you see anything else that could be considered a simple shape? Of course, once you get down here to her hands, there's big triangular shapes here. You can see that big triangle. And then this big square of a cuff. Her arm. And this rectangular shape of the pad of her hand. Which put just about right. My thought at first was this would be more like a caricature of her. But, you know, going back to what we learned last month about basic shape shortcuts is circles, squares. There's a triangles with her. And, again, I haven't taught a class this way before, but I believe that stating things simply, putting those cheekbones in, because those are really prominent with her, seeing those circles, and I neglected... There's a circle, an oval for her chin, and there's a circle from her nose. I don't know if you can see it here, but starting under her nostrils down to just halfway between her bottom lip and her chin. There's a, there's a half of an orange there. There's another circle on her chin that I did not put in. Um, do you see any other shapes that I missed? Putting the ear in as a big oval like that was helpful to me, just for finding placement. And then putting those little her little bun back there in as two simple shapes was also helpful to me. Anybody want to share? I also put a little note at the top for a sphere in a box, and maybe I should add a triangle on there just to help my brain remember those very simple shapes. There we go. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly, that's all I wanted you to do is just to see those simple shapes. Remembering, again, you know, I can't not measure that's so ingrained in me to measure. Two and a half heads will help you with layout, even if you're gonna do a quick gesture. If, even if I'm gonna do a two minute um, figure of somebody, I'll put the top, the bottom, and the halfway mark. You know, those are just two things that are ingrained in me to do, no matter what you're doing. Um, but it's helpful. You might do it a little bit bigger. Oh yeah, I'll take you off. You might do it a little bit bigger, um, and you might practice getting your hand because sometimes you can tell if you've been kind of cautious with it but if you get that hand going and you think about rhythm the rhythm of those hand those uh, her hands down here it's sort of like rocking a baby there the way she has her arms and you can see that in our work if we get too persnickety about it you can tell and so i think this gesture if you'll do it over and over and until you can get a beautiful rhythm to these shapes i think that'll that'll carry over into your fi finished piece of art. All right, any other comment? All right, I'm gonna try to do this again with, this next one is going to be only the outline. So you're not gonna be doing simple shapes, you're just gonna be looking at the perimeter shape, uh, which is a little more challenging. So get you a new piece of paper. Be a little bit easier. It's just doing a drawing using the perimeter. And I like to go ahead and get a, a quick idea of my head. And I like to do a, a quick gesture drawing. It just helps me a little bit. I did it smack dab in the middle. So catch yourself if you're doing that. All right, so I'm gonna match angles as I move around the head. I'm not gonna think about any measurements inside. And I'm gonna go slowly, rather slowly. Just thinking about the outline of this. No interior sketching, just the outline. Let's see how well we do. 
This is where you want to match angles. I'll probably say that. All right, moving slowly. So I stop myself. I can see how off I am on this side. If I just move around this side of the face without any real measurements. See how much negative space there is here. And matching angles, you know, that's close your eye and match the angle. So I can tell that that comes out much further. I'm not, again, I'm only doing perimeter. And so that's pretty much the it. That's it for the perimeter. Um, I'm off, I can tell. But again, that, that reminds you, I was taught to start from the inside and work your way out and you'll be much more accurate as you do that. So if you just do this without thinking about simple shape and mass, if you do this alone, you're gonna have a lot of corrections to do. All right, so the next one, I'm gonna, okay, so let me stop there. Um, I'll leave the image up for just a minute. Any observations about trying to do the outline of it? Harder, easier? Is it your nature to do that? Yeah. Um. I don't know. I I was looking at the, the negative space on the on the, instead of her outline. I was, you know, like it, it's kind of weird, but it can you oh, see it? Yeah, uh, stop it. Hold on. I mean, it was kind of weird, but I don't know. I was looking at the negative space of you know, like is that? I didn't know if that's what you meant until I looked yes. at yours. Well, the outline is all, and you do have to watch negative space as you go around the edge, you know, like where it, where it's her neck and her head connected yeah. was the main place that I saw some negative space. Um, yeah, it was hard. It was it, hard. It's, it's harder. harder to do it that way. And when we did um, the lesson last year on drawing animals, that Aaron Blaze had us, or he did several silhouette drawings of an elephant and how interesting the shapes were, um, that, that's something I never think to do. So when you just look at, is your perimeter shape interesting? And so he would have, you know, like the elephants posing this way or just standing stagnant was kind of boring. So that's an interesting thing to think about when you're posing your model or when you're thinking about that outward shape. It can have action to it. It can have interest to it as well. We don't ever think about perimeter shapes. So that was just something new for me to mention and, and for us to do. Um, anybody else have any observations about that? I don't particularly like that way, but that's typically the way we start drawing most of the time. When you first start drawing, you just think about the outline. Then you, it's almost like the exercise where you don't lift your pencil and you just do the whole outline. And then when you get done, it's all kind of wonky. It's, it's like too squished or too fat or something because you're just looking and thinking about the outline instead of the simple shapes and the negative spaces or the, the blocks. Did everybody get a chance to do that? All right, well, let's move to the next one. This is the massing and shaping and shapes. So you're, you're gonna be combining both things. You're going to be combining um, your simple shapes, your squares, your circles, your triangles, and then you're going to quickly mass them in. Shirley would have us do an exercise of this when um, with not using any lines, but only thinking in masses of light, medium, and dark. So that's going to be our goal. It's going to take a little bit longer to use your, um, your charcoal and the side of your charcoal to mass quickly. If you don't have a blending stump, you might want to grab one right now to blend with because I'm mostly going to be using that to draw with a little bit later on. I didn't mention that earlier. If you have a blending stump or a paper towel or something, you can roll into a, a, a stump or a blender. So, the challenge on this one will be not to draw a lot of detail, but to just, again, draw the simple shapes. So here again, my, my head is two and a half heads tall. I got that a little bit too big one. Two, yep. One, two and a half heads tall. All right, so I can do my simple shape, my circle, my box.
and then the hands. And then I'm just massing with charcoal, so that's easy to erase if, if it gets out of control for you. Just quickly draw the simple shape, mass it in, get rid of the, the lines as quickly as possible. Uh, we tend to get dependent on lines, and if you can just squint and think simple shapes uh, in the beginning. I'll see that ear's a little bit lower. Another quick measurement that's very helpful is height to width. So the widest place from her cheekbone to the back of her hair is the same as to her hairline. Cheekbone to the back of her hair. So you can see that it needs to be a little wider. And actually this one is, is pretty good at massing. So let me try that one for a second. If you go ahead and do this pretty early on, you can establish those darkest darks. And you won't need to you'll kind of etch this in your brain that this is darkest dark. And everything else should just kind of disappear. Remember the halfway point is her eye. So it's, that's easy to check. This is going to be the halfway point. And the halfway point width wise, I'm going to say is the side of her iris. So that's going to be the side of her iris on this eye. If you wanted to go ahead and, and put a little indication of where her, there's the simple shape for eyes. Then we know that's your halfway mark. Again, um, cheekbones are right under that. Simple shape. Simple shape. Nose. This is pretty distinctive on her mouth boy it's gonna go it's gonna go through some awkward spells here but that's just the way it does especially if you're only thinking in simple shapes and masses you're not thinking on any detail yet so there's that dark not really much dark until you get down here to the arms so you got this angle Again, matching angles, this angle of the wrist. You got this uh, triangular shape down here and you need to, we need to be checking. This is all the way over here, see? The side of her wrist or the, where her arm starts is all the way over here. <clears throat> so it's weight, it's clear out here. That's the bottom of the wrist, sorry. See how easy it is to get out of whack. That's where her arm starts on the bottom. So I would have put it way back over here. So here's the white part, which comes down about here. That's the white part of her sleeve. This is her hand. And then this is the other dark shape right here. And it starts just below. This arm starts just below. If you went straight up through her nose here. Right here. Very lightly on any of these other shapes because I, I only want to create a bit of a value drawing at this point. Okay, so the other thing I use sometimes is a piece of cheesecloth with some charcoal inside and a little cotton ball. And sometimes I just dab it like that to just sort of, now you see it makes a mess. I hadn't used it in a while. Um, I've got a couple of these. Um, and then you can just take a blending tool and start to draw the dark shapes with a paper towel, uh, a Q-tip, a, a tortillon, one of these little sponge applicators that I like to use for details. Uh, I'm going to use this tortillon right now. 
and just sort of blend some of these darks. You can see it's going to fall onto my, to my easel. It's good to have a little paper towel or something underneath there. But just begin to draw some of these dark shapes in. And this, this creates a nice, see that I can tell that comes out a little bit farther than I have it. And then you've got, you've already got this kind of on the tortillon. You can take your eraser and lift some of it off. Um, drawing those cheekbones as circles is a little disconcerting. They do really stick out quite a lot. But using the tortillon makes you think in mass and not linear, which is real challenging but to switch between the two. Don't let yourself get bogged down with this. Again, you're just trying to isolate these dark masses and begin to uh, see this in a more in a more of an abstract way and not in a coloring book fashion. This is really dark under her chin. This is really dark here. It's right up through the edge of where her nose would be, so that might be a little further over here. just to start to see where the value changes are. This really goes a little bit more this way. And the measuring will come in in the next stage, but right now you really just want to figure out where all your masses go. So it ends up being one big um, middle tone <laughs> mass. So how do you handle that? Well, that's where your, your little if you have one of these mono zero erasers, these are real handy. You just like a pen and you just pop them out further. You can carve some of your lights out with this eraser if your paper will erase very well. And this is a cheap check, text, uh, sketchbook, so it's not gonna erase really well. But you can also just use one of these, um, these erasers to lift out areas of light. You can see her jawline is light around the perimeter of her face. Just kind of clean that up a bit. Her ear, kind of pull some of that out. The side plane of her head. And, you know, if it's driving you nuts, just switch to your, your uh, mechanical pencil so you can come in here and get a little bit of, of detail done. Her eyes are really distinctive. She has very deep eyelids. Um, and those are going to be key. And one of the things I noticed right off the bat is these eyes don't, aren't even. The tear duct is here and way up here. I don't know if that's an error on her part in the drawing or if that is the way her eyes really were. But just doing these drawings, and again, they're not supposed to be beautiful drawings, just doing these right now to, to sort of find your way around this face and make some mental notes of shapes and values and perimeter edges. Those are, are going to be so helpful to you when you start doing the painting. And don't worry if it's not, I mean, you see mine is not very good at all right now. So don't, uh, don't fret about that. Just do it. Just do it because you're, you're just doing your study right now. There is a middle tone. This is all kind of a middle to light tone right here. And that'll help you to go ahead and get your dark, your medium dark, your middle tone, your middle tone light, and your lights. Um, if you can do that right now, that would be ideal with this drawing. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to work on that. And I'll come back and, and uh, we can look, we can compare together what we've done. Okay. I made a few uh, observations. I stepped back from it and I came in here and drew a little bit just to kind of get an idea if I have the tilt of this face right. 
So one of the important things I did, even in just doing a mass drawing like this to establish value, is that you don't have to be careful. I stuck her head right in the middle, which is what we always do. So this is a great um, time to note that the head is not in the middle. And you'll always end up running off the page if you do that. So great, uh, great first observation. Second is from her tear duct straight down is where her cuff to her sleeve is because it's hard to swing these arms on and get those correct. So from her tear duct on this side straight down is where the cuff of her sleeve is going to be. All right. And I checked that a couple of times, but I still got it wrong, which is going to put her hand over here. And if you wanted to, you know, check all the way across, you see that her hand is going to start to change direction here and then go down here. So it's not too far off right here. It's probably okay. There's a nice dark area here along her arm. That's one of your darkest darks. And then you've got some shadowing on the bottom here to get that arm to be placed correctly. And you've got some sh some dark down in here. So so that's not too far off. Um, again, I, don't, I didn't want to get into drawing too much, but I could not make sense. Uh, a lot of people complain about charcoal because it just gets everywhere. And it's hard to, to carve that likeness back out. But play around with it for a little bit and just see if you can get these lightest lights, which there's no light lights on her face. Lightest lights are down here, which I'd probably end up having to go back and put some charcoal on if I get the paper too dirty. But that's okay. Uh, this is light. This is light. This is light. I can move that plumb line here out of the way. This is light here. And then her little tie there. So come back with this. I've grabbed a little bit of my uh, charcoal powder off the bottom of my easel and I'm using that to to draw with to shade these in. The top lip almost always is darker than the bottom lip, and it looks better if you'll just mass it in without a lot of detail. And oftentimes, just put a shadow under the bottom lip. I don't really see that. I see a shadow right here with her. This dark piece right here, this little abstract shape under her chin, and then this dark piece from the corner of her chin down is pretty much a landmark or an anchor point for you. And then one here. And I did measure to see um, the distance from her chin to the, her neckline is almost half of her face. So chin to neckline is there, and that's correct. Another little piece of dark here. Any kind of little little areas that you can get landmarks in. Go ahead and spend the time doing that. The ear here is all middle tone. You do have a dark right in here. Now how do I know that I have enough room there? Well, again, there, you just can't get away from measuring. But the halfway mark from the edge of her ear to her iris, the side of the iris on the right, on this eye that I'm looking at on the right, is the halfway mark. So there's the edge of the ear. So that's about right. The top of this dark, I've drawn a line here. You can see how one eye is lower than the other. If you tilt this up, get it to where they're a little more even. But I really don't think that's the case. I think that one, I mean, just looking at it, you can see that one is lower than the other. All right, so even if it were that, that much, and it's not, you can see because of her nose. Let's Actually, let's go down here to her nose, and let's rotate it to be even with her nose. See, there's the two nostrils. There's her mouth. 
and the eyes would be parallel to that. So here's, see how much higher this one on the right is than the one on the left. But um, you can also see that the top of her eye, right eye, is about parallel with the top of the ear. So that's about right. I gave you guys those, those sketch app images. I don't know that they're going to be very useful. You may look at them and see something in there that you want to do as far as vignetting part of the drawing. But they're not real accurate on values and shapes. They just kind of make up some values and shapes. This um, part of her skin is darker than this. So just, if you want to play around with this and do, this is what this is for, value study right now, without really worrying too much about is the drawing accurate. If you squint, you can see this is much darker than this. So go ahead and, and do that, even if you just have to make it one value. And maybe go back in and darken a few areas and lighten a few areas. Same here, squint. Same here, squint. Up here it's very dark. This goes this way, this goes this way. This goes this way. Think about the planes as you're working on this. And then this way. Again, do not worry about this being a beautiful drawing right now. It's not meant to be. This is your musical scales. This is you doing some warm up to try to understand what's in front of you. Now this is darker right in here. Not that dark, but you got some stripes and things over here. And again, don't be concerned with any of these details right now. This looks a little, maybe too far, but we can measure that later and see what needs to happen with that. This hand, just go ahead and mass it in. Darkest darks, if you have to come back in here and do this a couple of times, don't hesitate to. I like uh, these little notations here. These are really distinctive with her. So go ahead and try to get those in. You do not have to show your work right now. This little corner of her mouth comes straight down. And then this corner comes straight down from the side of her iris right here. Uh, you might go ahead and get those in because those are nice dark anchor points and here's a little piece there. And see how that already begins to make a difference and help you see her. These, this is very dark in this corner. Eyebrows way up here. Another eyebrow. Let's see, here's her lid line. And there's her brow way up there. I might redefine this a bit get this piece up here. See how you can just keep going darker and darker. This is going to be a really fun study to do. If it helps you, just take um, your charcoal and do some light lines like that and then when you come back in with the tortillon or blender, then you can blend those out and make them a little softer. That totally melts. That is totally defined by this on the side. All right, so squint down, look at your darkest darks. This is there's no light in here, so I need to get rid of all that light. It's very dark here. This glabella area under the eyebrows is very dark. And 
Now I stuck my hand in here and I lost that nice light in her eye white because her skin is so dark in the face right now with the way the light is. The eye whites are the whitest part of her face. Can't hardly get those. So that's where you might have to go back in if you were, if this were your drawing and use a white um, pastel pencil or a piece of chalk or something like that. So your final assessment, I would just scoot back from your sketchbook, squint your eyes, and click, flick your eyes back and forth between the image and your, your drawing, um, your mass, your, your value drawing. Um, mine feels really messy and muddy with this charcoal. It goes faster with the charcoal. It is messy and muddy. I'm going to leave all this because I think this helps me remember these dark anchor points on the mouth. I don't have the nostrils right at all, but you can really feel the roundness right here. It's almost like a half of an orange would fit right here. Don't forget that as you're working on the actual painting or drawing that you're going to do. Quick review on my uh, perimeter drawing, my outline. Uh, you see I did it this very same thing. I stuck the head right in the middle. And you just we just are, are prone to do that every time, no matter how many portraits I've done. So reminder that the head is gonna go over to the side. Also, even for the perimeter drawing, it's great to check height to width. If you wanted to get more accurate, you could say from the brows to the chin is the same as from the ear to the iris. So you can find something that's the same as. Uh, her head is longer than it is wide. So that's bottom, that's key. So let me go back and say from the widest point on her face, her cheekbone, to the back of her hair, okay, is the same as chin to just here where her part would be. So cheekbone to hair. So that's about right. That's that's about right. Always just find something that's uh, that you, it's relative on the face that you can check it against to measure that height to width. And then my my first drawing, which was simple shapes. Again, it's creepy but it made you look at the skull. And let me, before we finish, let me draw the box over the top of this head so that we can see where the planes change. So if you broke this into planes, it would be something like this. The side plane is, it ends right here, right, right here at her zygomatic arch. Comes down this way this way, this way. Yep. Uh, on the hand, you could put a bit of a box over the hand as well. Whether I have that in the right place or not, I don't know, but you can look at the fingers and each finger, you can see the top and the side. So here's the top, and here's the side, here's the top, here's the side. So you could put a box over each of those fingers after you get to a little further down the road as far as where your drawing goes. Road as far. All right, I'm gonna stop there. That's the end of it. Uh, these last little things of putting the box over the head, putting the box over each finger. If you just make some notes of that, the halfway marks, the anchor points, uh, light, mediums, and darks. If you, if these are all excellent pre-planning things that will keep you on track when you begin to take this further as a, um, a full-on painting or collage or whatever you decide to do with it. Uh, again, the, our whole purpose here is to learn. So we aren't, again, in this this stage or next week. We're not trying to make some masterpiece that we're going to want to show everybody. Uh, it's our proper planning prevents or piss poor piss performance. performance. Right, <laughs> exactly. I did, I, I did put some lines of demarcation uh, on this PowerPoint image to show you the tilt of her head, to show you that there is more of a tilt of her shoulders when I looked at that further. 
So it's kind of um, it's kind of this way and a bit this way with her body. So it's you, you know you're going to want to remember that. You're going to want to make some lines to remember those tilts along with the plumb line. I put that one smack dab down the middle to show you where her cuff is and where her uh, the, her tear duct, her tear duct, her left nostril, almost the left side of her mouth, and the tip of her cuff on her arm all line up in that one plumb line. So that could be a really good reference point for you when you lay those hands and arms on down at the bottom. All right, any, here's another one. Here's the box. I drew this box over her head. I'll send that image out as well because that helps you see. Now the whole top of her head isn't flat like that. The planes go up, like her brow ridge is one angle, her forehead is another angle, her part is another angle, the top of her head is another angle. So there's planes all along that top part. But remember that the whole front of her face goes in this area here, if you put a box over the top of it. Um, here's that sketch app that I use, STD, if you haven't ever used that before. And you see all the different options. You know, this, this wasn't helpful for values because it just draws it kind of like a cartoon. Um, but it does show you the hard edges because it picks out the hardest edges for you. So if we go back and look at this painting in color and grayscale, where would you, help me pick out the hardest edges? Around her arms, her, her uh, hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean. A lot of contrast there. Mm -hmm. there the out. Are in her eyes. Yep. Her, oh, okay. Uh, and Denise did this drawing, and, and I, that was part of my critique, but as we look at it further, it's almost like she has eyeliner on under her eyes. And it's then right... Inside. Say that again, Peach. Ear, right there. Inside her ear. There's a yes, sharp sir. edge there. Right here along her... Um, her tear duct and where the um, side of her nose is, is a very dark edge. And then down along her left, right there. Yeah, you've got this, this, this is fairly sharp right here, and that's a tricky one. But those are, that is part of what makes her look like her, are those little lines right by her nose. So if you get those right, you're going to capture her likeness more readily. The, like you said, her eyes are are sharp and detailed. This over her li left lid shows how deep set her eye sockets are and large her eyes are. She has large eyes and large eyelids. So those sharp edges, noting hard, where does, where are the edges, uh, where do they melt? Shoulders. Okay. Definitely right here at her neck. That's an important one that I learned from sergeants, studying some of sergeants work. If you make all the edges around the neck too sharp, they just look real rigid. So if you can find a place to let the neck melt, shoulders are melty, Amy, that's exactly right. Down here around her hands, um, where the sleeve and the hand meet is very soft and melty. What about on her head? Where do you see a soft edges on her head or face? All around her. In her, inside her hair, so to speak. Oh yeah, no hard edges here. None. It would look like a football helmet. Face into her forehead. Mm -hmm. Kind of just melts right in there. Right here. Yeah, that too. Yep, and it right here in her ear, between her ear and her face, and also down here on her chin. It totally melts. There's like an entry point right here on her chin, where it melts, and the the chin melts into the neck. The neck melts into the front of the chest here. So those are important things to look for. Want to share or tell me any observations you have from your drawings? Again, they're not masterpieces. They're not supposed to be. Um, is this helpful to you? It's not gratifying, okay? All right, Peach, what you got here? Okay. Looks like a little skeleton. It does. It does, her features are really strong. You can see the bone structure, and that's part of what's so interesting in her. So we're gonna have to work to soft, at once we get the skeleton on there, we're gonna have to work to put beautiful skin tones on top of that and soften down the skeletal shapes. 
because that's what's so beautiful about her is that we're going to have to mix burnt sienna out of orange and blue. We're going to have to find some cool tones. Shelly, what do you want to share yours too? Let me take you off, Peach. No, I just saw your paper up. Did you? Yeah. Oh, nice. And that's charcoal. Yeah? That, I had pencil. I don't have charcoal. You did but, that with pencil. That's awesome. Um, I was going to say, it's awfully neat for charcoal. How do you feel about it? <laughs> um, it's interesting. I've, I've never, I've never drawn, um, a black person before. And I found myself getting, um, lost in, in the, the curves and how much, um, what am I trying to say? It was just an interesting, um, experience compared, you know, I'm used to drawing other people or myself. And so I don't know why it, it seemed different, but I like the it. features, the features you're talking about. I think so. And my, yeah. I have friends, I have friends who are, who are black and I just, I, I tend to stare at them a little bit because like their skin is so beautiful and, and different ones. And, um, it's interesting. They, they gotten used to it now, but you know, <laughs> like, I'm sorry, I'm staring. I'm just seeing <laughs> lots of shapes in your face that, that are so beautiful. But, um, wow. so I, I had a little bit of trouble. Um, this paper made it easier cause it's toned paper, but, um, I was having trouble not over. Oh, we lost you, Shelly. The, the, um, the blending part, hers again was so neat with the pencil and I, I, it looks like she used a lot of the side of her pencil, which is really important because that's what you want to do when you're, when you're working in the values and the masses. Um, and this woman has really strong features. And I think that's again what draws us to her is the strong, the strength of her face and the um, the power in her face. Anybody else want to share theirs? Jackie, hold on. Oh, awesome! So the only thing, and it'll give you a little. I know quick, it's all this. <laughs> no, all a little quick critique is to just move. It's more of an outline drawing. Move to yeah. get those darks in her hands. Right. And yeah. that I know you're you're not there yet, but you will. But get those mm -hmm. darks in her hands, and then try to make yourself isolate into at least three values. But the drawing okay. is excellent, and you've got it okay. on the paper. You're 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 drawing small, and that's certainly fine. Yeah, um, yeah. It just but planning. <laughs> if you want to draw bigger, you can. The smaller it is, the quicker you can go. So for what we're doing here, that's yeah. excellent. But sometimes I'll go ahead and put a mark. I'll look at it for just a second, put a mark where I want the top of the head and the bottom, and that makes me fill up a space. Sometimes okay. it'll look a little bit lost if it's a big piece of paper and a little drawing in there. Um, it, it all depends on where you're going, um, but excellent drawing. And Thank think you. about, Shirley made us do a whole drawing with no lines, with just masses. And that is hard yeah. to do. That's hard mm -hmm. to do. It's excellent to do a line, a linear drawing, and a mass drawing, and make sure the mass has three or four values in it. Denise, jump in there. Sorry, Jackie, I'll get you off. Boom, yeah. <laughs> I did. Jump in there, Denise. Are you waving by? Um, so, let's see if there was anything else. Norma, you want to show yours? Hold on. Can they see you? No. Awesome. And you've got your values. You've got a beautiful drawing already and your values. Mm -hmm. One of the things I noted, a, a good intersection is right here at the corner of her chin is where her shoulder starts to come out. And I'm not even looking at the picture now, but because I've looked at it so much. So you have her, her shoulder down a little low. So if you would bring that shoulder out right here from the corner of her chin, I think I'll have to look at it again. But when the we, shoulders are so important because shoulders have everything to do with expression. So if they're too low and too small, it makes the head look big. If they're too high, it makes them look like they have no neck, you know, so that's so important. 
beautiful drawing. But keep working on them a little bit if you want to this afternoon and try to get those three values and try to get rid of all your lines in that third drawing. So you have no, you're not drawing, that's fine. Just look at her a little more and get just get familiar with some things. If you walk away today with a few things in your memory, your visual memory about her, you know, I have those big round cheekbones in my visual memory. Um, I have the corners of her mouth in my memory. I have not to put her head in the middle because I did it two, two times. Make sure there's some space in front of her. Um, I know where the darkest darks are now in my memory. I know where her middle tones are. I know where the lightest lights are. Those are all, my doing this and watching it again with you guys has really imprinted it so that when I begin to work on the painting, it will be a little bit more second nature. I can get into the rhythm of working instead of being so analytical about it. Mm -hmm. That's our goal is just to do it that way, to know where the soft and hard edges are. Make some notes if you want to. Do, use your sketch note ability to do that. Um, and, and even, Denise, if you just end up doing some torn paper with the colors, if you have a bunch of colors out or if you have some watercolor brush to just do color sometimes i sometimes i can draw um i did i sent you what i drew the other day mm. i can't do it today so it's just it's changes all day every day to you know from one hour to the next what i might be able to do so you know when i can i do it's just not working this morning and that's part mm. of what makes us better artists is the adaptive ability that we have to go to plan b to plan c um even in teaching i don't i used to get flustered when the technical stuff didn't work and I could feel my heart, I could feel a red flush coming up. I don't even do that anymore because I just go to the next thing. We're going to get yeah, this. Yeah, today no it's like, it's glue and paste. It's glue. cut glue and paste day kind mm -hmm. of day. So you just pick different things. I pick different things, different days that I can do. So I try to make sure I have something I can do. You have no idea how that spurs us on to push through the obstacles keep doing it it's god put it in us to do it what are you doing with your spark that was what they asked us on that inspire segment what are you doing with your spark i would have you now to try to work on one of these a little bit more or start fresh but have a a, a pretty decent drawing for next week light even if you want to trace one of the ones that you did a light drawing that you can either put marker color pencil watercolor on we're going to just place colors we're going to pick colors first or mix them we're going to place colors with just a simple palette of whatever and we're going to do color study next week and um let me go back to my powerpoint so i'll make sure i don't forget something here and i got all the dates wrong so i apologize i need to fix that i was looking at the january calendar good grief y'all just bear with me i'm a i'm a mother of a toddler and a teenager remember that yeah <laughs> I'm giving myself lots of that. breaks. Um, that's all we're going to do next week. The third week, we are going to go ahead and get the background on. So if you have time and you want to go ahead and prepare your surface with a kind of, I like the fleshy, peachy tone, orangish tone. I see that in the painting a little bit. So if you want to get that ready, we, we will work on the background um, the third week. And I think that's... That's the main thing we'll do. Block in that background and maybe go ahead and put the little bit of words that she has on that background. Does somebody have a question? I do. Yes. Jack, Jack. I'll oh, show what oh, I did last. Oh, oh. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Let oh, me stop I'm sorry. And share. Go no, ahead. I just wanted. Oh, go, go ahead, Jackie. You, you're on. No, Jackie. I just go. Okay, I just wanted to. You said peachy. I already yes. have this done already. Perfect. So this is okay? Okay. That's perfect. If anybody else right. is doing it, that or lighter, don't get too dark with that. Um, but it's, it's a dark painting, so it's going to get darker. Uh, but I think that's okay. a beautiful color to glow up through there. Yeah, Denise, jump in there. I was just going to show the one that I did last week. Oh, please do. You did great on it. And that makes, look, y'all. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. And look, yeah. you've got the circles on the fingers and... What are your, I like your um, guidelines that come down from her face to her hands. I was, uh, those are plumb lines for where the knuckles hit and the, where the, you know, where this part. Kind of crisscrosses. Yeah, if, where they, 
I'm just, you know, hitting plumb lines is what they were. And I got to with, stop and just were, celebrate yeah. with her that you had a good day for drawing. And so you got to grab those when you, when you find them. Yeah. Whatever for us too, whatever our, our obstacles are, you say, oh, wow, I got it. This is a good little segment for me to jump in there and do some art. So I love that. Mm -hmm. Also note some rhythms in there. You might want to do some rhythmic things on one of your play drawings that we were doing today. And just note where you see beautiful rhythmic shapes in there. I think that's important. We ha Anybody else want to show your work? We have about four minutes. I'll, I'll, show, I'll end with this inspirational segment. If not, this lady is just awesome. Love being with you guys. Don't let anything keep you away. Um, I will share the video on this eventually when I get to it editing it because I do like to edit it and make sure everything's okay before I post it on there. Um, here we go. Her name is Brittany Scott and I think you'll really um, be inspired by this work no matter what you're doing right now in your life and her story. Here it goes. Everybody see? Okay. It's about six minutes long, so if you have to sign off, go right ahead. The landscapes are great and they're important also, but I knew that I hadn't been honest with myself about where I was meant to be. And I had specifically shied away from it out of fear and doubt. I saw a show called The Sacred Gifts and I walked in and the first painting you see is this five foot by six foot glorious painting of Christ kneeling in the Garden of Gethsemane with an angel over him. It was so powerful. And I had never experienced art that powerfully before, but I walked in and saw this painting, Agony in the Garden by Franz Schwartz, and I sobbed. I realized this is the art that I need to create. I had this vision of a painting flash in my mind, which has not happened to me before. I saw what my painting was supposed to look like. It was of Thomas falling and looking up at the Savior. And I didn't know the story of Thomas at all. I had no clue what I was even really like committing to, <laughs> but I, I knew that I had my next story. And so the next step was to learn the story of Thomas and figure out what it is that isn't being told and, and what is the story even about? There's her, her sketch notes. This painting, I've worked on it for over two years and I've done a lot of scraping. <laughs> <laughs> on the paintings, I've moved the heads multiple times, recast models. My friend who played Thomas for me has had to come over to my house like 10 different times so I could re-photograph him. And every time I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry you have to do this again. It's frustrating for them. It's humiliating for me. Like, sorry, I didn't get it right the first time. Sorry, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm an amateur, but I, I don't look at it that way anymore because it's all a part of the learning process. And once you learn to internalize and, and see that scraped off painting, not as a failure, but as one step closer to learning and understanding how to do it next time, then it's so much easier to just sand it down, scrape it off and move forward instead of like dwelling on it and sitting in that. I love this part. We have three years of Christ's ministry and so much more than what's in the scriptures. I don't believe that God would give us these tiny little stories to just say, and this one's about a guy that was doubting, but that's all that anyone remembers about the story is that it's doubting Thomas. 
And I dug deeper. And as I came to understand who Thomas was and, and what the experience was, I started to see myself in there so much more. And we look at the story. Eight days earlier, just a few verses earlier, we learn all the disciples were together except Thomas. And Christ chose to come at that time. So not only is he feeling like, I can't believe I missed this. I'm an apostle. I can't believe I missed this. Like, why wouldn't he come when I'm there? Why do you choose to come when everyone else is there? And why not me? And then Christ comes back just for him. And we know this because he says, Thomas, come forward. And singles him out from the whole group of people that's there. Thomas walked forward, and when he touches this Savior, I imagine it being electric, illuminating. And for the first time in his life, he knew. He knew who the Savior was. He knew why it all happened. He knew what that meant for him. And I believe that as they touched, and he had this understanding that he just like collapsed from the overwhelm of it all. My painting is of Thomas collapsing. He's not on the ground yet. He's not on his knees looking up. He's falling. And the Savior, knowing that he will fall, is catching him. That is such a testament to each of us that even though we feel like we're falling, and even though sometimes we feel like we're already broken and we're already down, the Savior will always catch us. Look at that easel. I failed repeatedly on this painting over and over and over again. It's exciting to know that through that failure came so much progression and that one day I will get there. Christ sees us and lifts us. In progress, her name was Brittany Scott, but in progress, I think that was key that she led us in to her journey. It's, I mean, you can see the back of his head is is not finished. You can see so much of it's not finished. Um, and you can see how many times she scraped it off. Um, I think that's it's just, and even to just watch her paint made me want to paint. <laughs> um, so any closing thoughts? Sorry, Denise, I had you on spot. I'd love to have an easel like that. Gosh, would But that, that was amazing. But, you know, I just love, I, that's what I, that's how I want to paint is <laughs> stories. I want to, you know, grab people in and tell them about Jesus and all that. It's, it was great. I, no, I loved it. I thought it would be a yeah. good bookends for us. The the Joy Couple and the, the Jesus Girl, I think it was just a great, um, great way for us to, start and finish. So y'all have a fabulous week. Send me your work this week if you want some critique. Carla, I'm so glad you're here. And um, just pop in whenever you can, even if you can just do it for a part of the time, even if you're not doing a full on thing, but please pop in because I love seeing you all. Uh, send me your work. I'll send you back some critique so that we can be ready to put some color on next week. And um, love you guys ever so much. Thanks so much, Christy. Thank Have you, Christy. Have a great week. You too.